Everyone, welcome to the Uke Stuff Podcast. And today I am here with Jim Biloff, who I think would be on the Mount Rushmore of the ukulele world. Um, especially as you look at this current, what we're calling the third wave of the ukulele. Truly, um, he is one of the main factors of why we have the ukulele today, why I'm playing it today. He has written 36 music books, three other books on ukuleles, 12 audio recordings, five DVDs, two classical works. And not only that, his publishing company runs one of the oldest and most valuable ukulele websites. Uh, his work, along with his sister and brother-in-law, resulted in one of the sort of legendary ukulele companies, the Magic Fluke. He's a clinician at, at ukulele festivals. I've had a chance to just run into him twice, even though I'm sure he had no idea who I was or afterwards thought about it because he meets everybody. Um, his efforts are totally supported by his wife, Liz, who ironically is the name of my wife as well. And he just published a memoir called Uketopia. He'll show it to you later. Um, if you're listening to this on audio, I'm holding up my phone copy on Kindle where I bought my Uketopia. I love a Kindle because then you can sometimes get a discount on the price, you know, when you buy it. Um, and really, Jim, it started all off buying a vintage Martin tenor ukulele at the Rose Bowl flea market in 1992. What I find amazing about Jim is he balances the goofy characteristics and the sort of whimsical characteristics of ukulele, as well as the serious side. So while he's written songs that are kind of, I don't know how you describe it, Jim, but like can't help but smile sort of has this. I'm not sure what that word is, but there's a it's an acknowledging the goofiness of the ukulele. And at the same time, he's overseen classical publications by John King, Tony Meisen, and James Hill on the ukulele. So he covers the whole gambit. So with that, Jim, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast today. Thanks so much, Chris. It's my pleasure. Um, the first thing, first question I was going to ask you is any news on the sales of the new book? How is it doing and performing so far, especially compared to your other books? Any idea? I know of one sale so far. <laughs> Yours. I know, I, know, I know quite a few people. I know Mark Pugh um, in the UK. I don't know if you've ever met Mark or not. He runs Stones Music in the UK. Uh -huh. um, he published a picture that he was reading it the other day. So I know there's, there's two. two more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my friend Eukster Brown also has bought it. So I think <laughs> you got at least three. No, I know it's there. So it's it's uh, it's it's climbing fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be right up there in the Amazon sale ranks. I love it. Um, now, I want to ask you, I'm a music educator. Your background is in music theater. We would have some similarities in terms of like courses we've taken, theory and other things down the road um, in our college years. But I want to ask you a couple of questions about your formative pre-college years. When you read the book, Utopia, and I don't want to ruin it for everybody because it really is an amazing journey. As, as Jim and I were just chatting before we hit record, Jim has had these like chapters or large groupings in his life of doing different things that are related but not. And I mean, just one of those experiences for most people would be a lifetime. And you, you've got these like three different clumps for sure. I think um, you're musical theater days, I think your days at the billboard, and then I think about your days at the ukulele. So I, I see them as related but separate. It's pretty amazing. Okay. But I want to first, as a music educator, having taught high school, currently teaching elementary, having taught middle school, uh, the first question is, I know you talked about playing the guitar and your dad led you to playing the guitar. Did you play any other instruments or do any other singing in school when you were in uh, especially high school or middle school? No, uh, okay. no, uh, the, I, I became fast friends with the guitar at a very young age. I did, I mentioned this in the book that when I was writing musicals and, and uh, focusing on writing them in college, I decided for my sort of my big senior project, so to speak, that I would attempt to write a more traditional musical with the piano because so many of my, you know, heroes from the musical theater world Sondheim and uh, and on and on and on and on, principally use the piano. And so, you know, I, I I wrote this score on the piano, and it has you know it has some it has some moments, but but my, the experience of writing on the piano didn't make didn't convert me. I went back to writing on the guitar. It felt 
far more comfortable writing for that instrument. And then of course, you know, as you learn later on, then, then I fall in love with the U principally because I love it as a songwriting tool. Mm -hmm. No, I hear you. I, I absolutely hear. I've been doing a lot of arranging uh, of Christmas carols the last couple of weeks and it just works so well. And one of the things I was going to mention is someday I'd love to be a college professor. I have my doctorate in music. You know, I would love to do that. The problem is that little issue of salary. It turns out that uh, college professors earn far less than a classroom music teacher. So um, it'd be a big hit financially for us if I would ever do that. But if I was ever going to teach college theory for all that choral, chordal analysis, yep. I would have every student buy an ukulele. Right. And I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not even joking about that. Um, back just without going too far forward, did you play the recorder when no. you were in elementary school or middle school? No. Okay. Interesting. I was just curious if you had that experience. Nope. So you talked about the fact that you were at one high school, I think as a sophomore, and uh -huh. you had proposed writing a musical and they kind of shot you down. Right. What it sounded like. And I, I, was, I was just curious, like what your relationship was with those teachers, because I imagine it was just traditional band, choir, and maybe orchestra in your high school. Yeah, you're right. You're okay. right. Um, uh, yes, it was a it was a public high school in my hometown uh, of Meriden, Connecticut. And you know, I don't I don't mean to to knock to knock those teachers at that time, but I just don't think that that, that the school was organized, especially the the quote unquote music department uh, slash theater department wasn't really organized to do original shows. You know, I think yep. you know, we, when we think of public schools, we mostly think that they put on popular shows that have been on Broadway. Yes. Um, and uh, and so, you know, here's a student who says, you know, I, I, I have a show and I'd like to put it on here. And I, I think, uh, understandably, they, they threw up their hands and said, you know, this really isn't, uh, this isn't what we do. And so fortunately, as I explained, you know, we, my parents, uh, at the urging of their friends, um, sought out an alternative, and there was this private school a, a town away, and I ended up going there, and that that really changed everything. Yeah, I made a note that you you performed, well, you wrote, produced, and performed three like large productions in high school that you created in your junior and senior year. That's yeah. unheard of. Nobody does that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not, not sure today. that's true, but <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think I'm a music educator, right? I was, I was teaching high school. Um, I don't I don't think that I would have had the foresight to open a kid that I didn't open up the doors to a kid that I didn't even hardly know because they weren't involved with the program. So it just really made me think. There's a lot of things with the ukulele that have made me think. And now, granted, you weren't playing ukulele yet, although you do have that oh, photo of you playing it once in college and you yes. don't even remember it, right? Yeah, barely. Yeah. That, now talk talk about foreshadowing, right? Yeah. Right. Here you are in college holding an ukulele, and later you'd become like the godfather of, of the third grade. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, I don't know. I, that, that whole discussion, and I just made me look inward and think, what would I do as a music educator if somebody had done that? So, I mean, I had, I had offered some courses that guitarists took, incidentally. So, like, we, we had a music theory class, and I had two types of students. I had the pre-college music major, and then I had the guitar player that knew that they were writing bad music and wanted to write better music. And what I found out is that the guitar players could learn just as well as the pre-college theory majors. The catch is they had to learn some different terminology. So instead of saying half step, he said fret. And the light bulb would go, you know, that sort of deal. So that whole that whole discussion just fascinated me. And I I don't know how many other interviews you'll do where somebody will actually get into that side of it. But I was just like, wow, that's and then to do three of them. Now you go from there into college, and then out of college, you end up landing in, in music theater, working with Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, and Stephen Schwartz. Right? Well, no, no. Not no. quite. No, not quite. Not okay. Stephen Schwartz. All right. Uh, um, and, and and not with Stephen Sondheim, although um, although I did I did meet him a couple of times. In one 
case. I, I spent an afternoon with him. Um, uh, he had invited me to come and share some of the work I'd done. And that was, uh, of course, uh, an extremely meaningful uh, afternoon. Um, and, and, you know, for those who know the story about Stephen Sondheim, who sadly passed away not long ago, yeah, like I mean, two weeks. So much, yeah. yeah, two weeks ago, um, I mean, his, his story is extraordinary, but he was mentored by Oscar Hammerstein, of course, you know, the Hammerstein to Rogers and Hammerstein. And, um, and, and that had such an, an enormous, um, played such an enormous role in his eventual career that I think he always felt that he wanted to kind of pay that forward. And so throughout his life, he was, he made himself available to people who wanted to write for the theater and would, and would generously give his time and share what he knew and, and try to critique your work in the, in the most, in, in the most um, generous way possible. And uh, so that was wonderful. But no, I did work on the other hand, um, while I was still in college, I, I got an internship on a musical that Leonard Bernstein wrote with Alan J. Lerner, who wrote, of course, My Fair Lady and many other great musicals. And it was a musical about the White House called 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And so for five months, this was the second half of my junior year at college, I was working uh, on that show, you know, on occasion, yes, running for coffee as interns do. Um, and, uh, but also when we went out of town and at, 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 the, uh, at the opening of the show uh, and for a few performances in Philadelphia at the Forest Theater, I was sitting on the marble steps of the, steps up to the, to the balcony with Leonard Bernstein while he whispered you know, all of his notes about the show as we watched it go. And it was, it was an extraordinary opportunity to, to, you know, watch this creative piece of work come together uh, with the man who wrote it. And, uh, and of course that show then suffered some real major setbacks um, and then finally closed after seven performances on Broadway. So it was, at the time considered one of the greatest flops in musical theater history. Although, although time has been kind to the show, it hasn't been done, it hasn't been mounted or produced, but the score, if you can seek it out, is well worth, uh, well worth uh, listening to. I'm really interested in seeing if I can find anything on it after reading your book. And it most makes you wonder, like, maybe it's time for a theatrical release of it or something or a reworking of it, especially considering the, you know, the recent, all the Sondheim news and other things. And right. but it's just, you know, they talk about the seven degrees of separation. It's just insane. When I was in college, you know, that was when, when he passed away, I think it was 1990. Um, I was in my freshman year of college and my music theory teacher came in, I mean, literally crying because he had passed away and um, that whole you know to think i'm talking with you who actually sat next to him i mean it's just that that's the kind of thing that as a music major you kind of geek out on i'm <laughs> and, and again that's the other thing I was, I was trying to tell my wife about you which is great because here you are you're this pivotal figure in the history of the ukulele i mean that's gonna i mean not to be really dark about it but someday on that's going to be your legacy that you leave right amongst all the other music yet you can walk down a street and nobody really will truly know who you are unless they're in this particular world that we live in isn't that crazy i mean and you just i don't know i just i you know i just i think it's amazing and yet your impact is so deep so i, I don't know I'm, i don't mean to like puff you up either but i'm just <laughs> It just, it's just amazing to just think about that and, and how this happens. So we'll get into some other questions for you. Um, doing your own arranging, I'm going to get, I've got a bunch of arranging questions for you. Do you do any of your own typesetting or do you still have somebody do that? I mean, do you like use Finale or do you use, um, you know, whatever the, the noteware program, Sibelius or Dorico, or do you have somebody do all that for you? 
all of it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. From the very beginning, we I mentioned her name in the book, but a woman named Charlou Roberts uh, came into our life uh, with this mostly with the second book, and she has engraved every single book we've done since then. And I am so eternally grateful to her and thankful because it's wonderful to work with people who are way better than I could ever be at that sort of a thing. Why not, you know, why not let somebody who does this for a living, uh, let them do it? So, yes. What does, what does the product you give her look like then? What is that sort of, is it just mapped out and she takes it further or have you like just handwritten it on, on a score or something? Yeah, it, um, that's a good question. It depends. I mean, we have, you know, we have a lot of different books with a lot of different, um, uh, you know, sort of origin stories. So, for example, if you, you mentioned John King, right? John yeah. King's book, he arranged and actually John knew how to, how to I, I'm, I'm not sure if he used Sibelius or Finale. It's been a while. But anyway, he delivered that book entirely engraved. And then the only thing that Charlou did was then she made it look sort of, you know, with the headers and the type, the typeface and all that to make it look like it was, um, it was part of the family of Jump and Jim songbooks. So, uh, so we always, you know, tried to have sort of a uniform look on the page. But, um, and then there were songbooks, um, like many of the smaller size songbooks, where I'm working from an existing arrangement yep. often. Um, and, and then I think I write about this, that, you know, it became pretty clear early on that a lot of keys for songs, especially if you go back way back to sort of the early sheet music, you know, E flat is a really popular key for singers. So it's not unusual to just find lots of sheet music in E flat. Well, as we know, E flat is not necessarily a uke player's favorite key. And so, um, so whether it's E flat or whether, you know, uh, I was arranging Beatles songs for the 60s Yukin songbook and then eventually the Daily Ukulele, you know, virtually none of the Beatles songs, there are two, two issues with Beatles songs and then in general songs that come from the sort of the, the guitar era. And that is that the keys that are appropriate in the guitar aren't necessarily um, the best keys for the uke. And, and the best example of that, of course, is the key of E, which is a, a natural key for guitar and a, and a really bad key for the uke. Then there's the other issue that we encounter with the Beatles, which is that they're impossibly pitched high because you're basically dealing with, you know, <laughs> Paul McCartney's extraordinary tenor. I mean, they're all singing at, at an incredibly high pitch and, and most men can't sing at that pitch. In fact, you know, it, it dawned on me that when we're in the car listening to some Beatles song, you know, nine times out of 10 for, for the average male, you're not singing with Paul McCartney, you're singing an octave down. And so, so I realized that, that I was going to have to, I was going to have to change keys a lot. And so Charlotte probably mostly would get arrangements from me where I'm changing the key. And then once I'm changing, and, and I'm not only changing the key, but then I'm changing the key to something within a small family of uke friendly keys, like obviously C, F, G, occasionally D, occasionally A. Mm -hmm. And then over time, Liz and I kind of found this sweet spot um, for, for vocal lines. We didn't want it to go too far below G, below middle C, and we didn't want it to go too far above C, above middle C. So there's some sort of a, an octave and a half in there that felt like the sweet spot. And if we both could sing a song fairly comfortably, we felt like we'd really hit pay dirt. So that was kind of where we found our comfort level. And it, so far it seems like, you know, that that works for most people. Yeah, I've, I've had the thought where, um... I know, I don't know if you're, you, you won't remember this, but I started the process of recording each of the original Daily 365 songs. I got, I got through about 11 of them and I needed to pick it up, but then I started doing all the, the ukulele play-alongs, like the Can't Help But Smile ukulele play-alongs. And on those, I will change keys in the same way. 
So you'll have a, a weird key. So we'll use software. I will use software and just drop or raise the pitch. Usually a half step is enough most of the time to make it better for the ukulele. Um, but yeah, when I've when I've tried to sing a lot of the the daily 365s as a tenor, I get myself in trouble because it goes too low. It's too low. You know? um, but there is one there's one Beatles tune that goes really, really high. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head that that's in the book. And it's like, then I feel that one up high too. So I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, you know, it, it, it is a worth, it is worth reminding people that, that people come in all, <laughs> in all flavors, right? So, so, you know, I mean, there, there, there are the four parts that we're all familiar with bass, tenor, alto, and soprano, and each one of them has a comfort zone and it's not the same as the other three. And so it is impossible to create a key that is going to be comfortable for everyone. And so we're really trying to do almost, impossible. almost the impossible by coming up with, and so what we did was we just sort of, we sort of, we if you can think of a Venn diagram, right? And so here yep. is, you know, one circle is the is the suitable keys for the ukulele. And the other one is sort of a, you know, uh, the voice uh, ranges. Yeah, the voice. Thank you. Voice yes. range, and then you 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 lay them over each other, and you find some place in between where you can find a good key to play in and a reasonably comfortable key for most people to sing in. So when you're actually giving your copyist, uh, you know, like for example, Braver. the songs out of the daily six three sixty five, um, are you just editing? an existing sheet then without having to rewrite it and then just adding notes? Yeah, so in okay. some cases, in most cases, I would say, yeah, if you, if I could show you our music book library, you'd be, you'd be impressed. It's, we have collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songbooks. And, um, and I would pour over them and look at the existing arrangements and ask myself, if, you know, how, how representative is this because everybody everybody's arrangements of pop especially popular songs but well even even you know public domain songs even you know Stephen Foster every, every single arrangement has some nuance to it and so I actually enjoyed getting into the into the into the weeds and surrounding myself with multiple arrangements of songs and because um, and I also mentioned this in the book, I have an unusually strong um, reaction or sensitivity to chords. And, um, and so sometimes chords are just wrong, or at least I was, I was not finding the right chord in certain arrangements. And so that led me to find what I thought at least was the right chord. And then, and then there were other determinations. For example, with the daily ukulele, I had to keep in mind that these books were largely intended for groups. Yep. So therefore you want to try to reduce the amount of chord changes, especially in bars, in measures, right? You yes. want to, and yet at the same time, of course, you don't want it boring. So you want to find nice chords to keep the motion, but you don't want to have a lot of grouped chords together because if you have 50 people playing that it's going to be a train wreck and so oftentimes my my job as sort of editor compiler was to remove chords and find out what is the most essential chord oftentimes it's the chord on the first beat and then ask yourself is that the most representative and then also is this a relatively easy chord to play on the uke and, uh, you know, and then marry that again with our, you know, our Venn diagram of the right key and then the right vocal range. And somehow or another, they would come together and then I would send this mess, to, <laughs> not terrible, but I would send a lot of notes to, to our, our engraver and she would, it, she would take a crack at it and then send it back to me and we'd go back and forth a, a fair amount until we, we got something that looked very clean and played very well. How many, um, for the average song, how many back and forth do you think that would normally be? Oh, I don't know, probably two or three. You know, oftentimes, of course, there would be typos and chords are in the wrong place um, and things like that. So, you know, um, 
you do become a real typo hunter. Yes. Big time. You know, you just, you just, especially if you think about a book like the daily ukulele, which, you know, has like 400 pages in it or something. Um, you, you know, you really, you really begin to look at the minutia of the music, the lyrics, the chords, everything. You can get kind of cross-eyed from it all, but you know, that's, that was our job. That's, that whole thing is amazing to me. And again, just so much respect. By the way, I was also going to mention, I think one of those Hal Leonard services are offering the individual pages yes. of the daily ukulele. Yeah. And I think when you do that, you might not be able to change keys on that. Yes. And that is so, something I have really, I'm so thankful that they've done that. And that's wonderful. Yes, you can go to the song and then you can press a key. Now, one thing I don't believe it does is it doesn't give you the new melody. Oh, really? Uh, but I, I could be wrong about that, but I know it gives you the new chords. Yes. I'm not sure if it changes the melody, but I could be wrong about that. And if you have perfect pitch, that will, that will drive you crazy. Right, because you know there, because also you know we're including the first note, which is really yes. important. So I'm not sure whether, you know, I, I just haven't looked at it in a while. But you know, that's a really important thing too. That was kind of a trademark of ours, which is yes. that you could always go to the song and then play that first note, and that could set you on your way. It was that first note, and then also like you talked about in the, is it the U tips and what tunes. is it the tips and tunes. Tips and tunes were using the parentheses chords. Yeah, the par oh. parenthetical chords. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool too. I mean, you know, and to think that you're the person that really made that happen. You know what I mean? You you I, come up with that. That's amazing. I don't know. It's just you know what? It's just because I love I love chords. Yeah, I really do. I, I mean, that was that was the revelation for me. Was we you know I find this Martin Tanner uke and I've got it, and then we we buy this stack of old songbooks from the 50s and actually the lucky break that we had was that Liz grew up on a steady diet of Lawrence Welk shows and so she sort of absorbed a large chunk of the great American songbook as a as a kid so when you know when I find this uke and we and we buy all these old vintage songbooks and we're going through them and there's like you know songs like deep purple and uh more than you know i didn't know more than you know but she did uh because she'd heard it before and so and so the chords were i was like knocking myself out really regular i was getting goosebumps playing this martin tenor uke playing these really sort of jazzy chords on these old standards and thinking this is some of the most satisfying music I've played in a long time. And that was that was also just so counterintuitive because I'd gone from a six stringed instrument, right? And I was pretty good. I was a James Taylor kind of guitarist. You know, I loved James. I loved um, Kenny Rankin. I loved jazzy singer songwriter guitarist with interesting chords and so there was really no reason why i should have suddenly been lit up by by an instrument with two fewer strings but that is truly what happened it's like i'm digging this in a way that i'd never dug the guitar and i i talk this may be a little bit too too inside baseball but but it dawned on me that I rarely played all six strings all the time on the guitar. So you're sort of picking and choosing. Whereas I realized you're playing all four strings pretty much nonstop. And uh, Liz and I both loved tight harmony, like barbershop harmony and tight acapella harmony. And so especially with the, with the My Dog Has Fleas string arrangement, because you've got the two high notes on the outside, it, it reminded me, I mean, I began to think of the uke actually as this portable barbershop quartet. And mm. so all the chords on it, I just imagined that each string was a member of like a barbershop quartet. And every time I moved one finger, it was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And so I was just sort of regularly uh, knocking myself out as I played through these pretty chords. On that same topic of your Martin, I just want to ask a couple of questions there. It was two hundred fifty dollars when you bought it in nineteen ninety two. Yeah, was was that a fair price or was that overpriced at the time? Uh, I would say that was a fair price. Okay, 
And now let's let's say that this isn't the Jim Beloff Martin at the moment. Let's say it's the same instrument, but not owned by you. Yeah. Because that adds a, a, a value. I don't, by the way, on a related note, uh, is it Mary Kay? Is it Sing or? Oh, what is Mary. Oh, May Singy Breen. May Singy Breen. That's it. Um, her, a couple of her ukulele showed up on that antique road show. Did you ever see that one? Oh, yes. And the, the value increases, of course, when, you know, sh it was her instrument, right. right? And by the way, I heard some of her works are available on the um, IMSLP website. You can actually download a couple of hers that have been scanned in. Um, but anyway, let's say that that instrument isn't yours, which would increase the value of it. How much do you think that instrument would sell for in today's market? I mean, do you have any idea? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Martin, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not particularly good at, I don't keep track of prices at all, but I would, you know, uh, I look at eBay every once in a while to see what prices are. And um, I don't know, thousand bucks. Okay. Yeah. For a, for a, you know, a good condition, Martin tenor, uh, $800 to a thousand, somewhere in around there. Now, did you have to have any like luthier work done to it at the time or was it in just great shape? It was in great shape. Yeah. Okay. And did it, does it have friction tuners or did you, do you, do you know what it has or did you change them maybe? No, 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 no. It had, uh, yeah, it just had, you know, uh, it was a fifties Martin tenor. So it had, um, yeah, it just had the friction tuners. Yeah. All right. So on a related note with that, Martin, you start talking at times about the reasons why you love the ukulele. So what I did is I kind of condensed all of them into a little list. And I want to get your feedback on this list. Um, do you want to take it point by point? However you want to do it. Okay, let's do it. Um, the first one is you took to the ukulele because the tuning was relative to the guitar. Right. Um, the second one is that at the same time, it was easier to play than the guitar. The third one, actually, I guess there's 11. Um, the chords sounded richer to you or just as satisfying to you as on the guitar, if that's correct. Uh, the next one is the ukulele then was more portable than a guitar. It brought happy memories and warm feelings for older people. <laughs> it was the ideal instrument for lapsed guitarists, you say. <laughs> right. I love that. It was the perfect pathway to a guitar if you want to go there. It didn't require electricity and was a portable radio on which you make your own music. <laughs> the music was retro. Um, and then two more. And this one was really poignant. I don't know if you wrote this in context of COVID. I don't know how much of your book was done before COVID, but you said, in the uncertainty of life these days, the uke represents a way to remember and recreate happy music where people sing together. What Did you come up with that during pandemic, pre-pandemic, or, or some other time? Oh, I think that's a quote from an article, right? That that's really? right. well. That was yeah. I don't know if that's in what you said in an article or if you just said somewhere else. I'd have to look. It, I could look it up. But I just, I just, I was like, boy, that's really, rel you know, that's really poignant today. It's really significant today in our in our world of of masks and COVID shots and all that other stuff that we're going through, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other one is the third wave of the ukulele includes a large number of retired and semi-retired people who meet in groups and go to festivals. And that's another reason why people took up the ukulele. You took up the ukulele, although that those groups didn't exist when you started. Yes, that's right. So it was like some of the larger groups we think of today as being like the archetype for those other groups. They weren't even around, which is crazy. Um, so... So, I mean, is there anything you want to add about that list? But I was just compiling all of them. And I just thought it was a kind of an amazing list of, of reasons to buy the ukulele. It's not just the, it's easy to play and it's cheap. Well, you know, and, and don't forget too, that in the beginning, it was a chance to stand out, right? Because yeah. so few people were playing it. It was, as I like to say at the time, it was off the pop culture radar. Yeah. So. So, you know, everybody, I mean, even in Hawaii, the guitar had become the dominant, you know, popular music instrument. The ukulele, the ukulele was mm -hmm. kind of considered an instrument of the past, you know, something your, 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 your grandparents might play or your parents might play. So, uh, 
so yeah so it wasn't it just wasn't visible or or if it was it was used as kind of a prop right you know it was you know you'd have a you know some kind of backyard luau and that would be something to to play for a photograph or something so it just wasn't taken seriously and of course you know tiny tim who was really a, a, a one of the great misunderstood artists but but still um didn't didn't do a lot of favors for the instrument his you know his reputation uh still carried a lot of you know he was still fresh in the minds of a lot of people when we started out so in in 1992 when we published the first book and you know people are asking hey you know what are you guys up to these days and we'd say well you know <laughs> uh you know interestingly enough we just published a ukulele songbook i mean literally within three seconds somebody would then start singing tiptoe so i mean it was that it was the uke and tiny tim were were really tightly linked yes they were for a good portion of the beginning of of our of our ukulele adventure even in my own playing, and I've I've been playing since '96, so I'm not or not 2006, not '96, 2006. I've been playing, so not that long in my life. The ukulele had no part of my music training, getting growing up, and my two thoughts of the ukulele were Tiny Tim and of course Hawaii. Right. You know, um, the Brady Bunch had Don Ho uh, with with an ukulele and another singer, Sam, I think a Sam. Um, on the, the Brady Bunch when I was growing up. You know, those were shows that I watched as a kid growing up. And I'm, I'm almost 50 at this point. But even I was at a music teacher conference a couple of years ago in Iowa where I present on the ukulele and technology and music education. These are my things. And a guy came up to me and said, I was, I was checking out ukulele at a booth because that's what I do. If I see ukuleles, I've got to touch them. I don't know if you're the same way. And uh, sure enough, a guy comes up to me and goes, starts singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips. And I was just like, man. So you are reading my mind. One of the next questions I had was, how do we navigate the influence of Tiny Tim? Or do we even have to? Because pop culture today has already kind of almost forgotten about him. I don't know. What, any thoughts there? Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right. I don't think we have to navigate him anymore. Sadly, in a way, um, you know, if you talk to, to young people, you know, of a certain age, and you ask them who Tiny Tim is, they're more likely to say it's a, he was a character in, in uh, Dickens. <laughs> so uh, you're right, you're absolutely right. But you know, I mean, growing up, I was watching the Johnny Carson show where he got married to Miss Vicky on you know TV, and watching the laughing videos. You know, I, I've been trying to put together some YouTube clips of historic ukulele players, and I'd love to find some of the people. Um, you know, from the past. Again, it what's Breen, right? Is their last name? May Singy Breen, yeah. May Singy Breen. There are no video recordings that I know of of her. I would love to have that to be able to show students, to be like, hey, the ukulele wasn't just male-dominated. Look at this person. And she was a massive teacher and, you know, recording artist. And unfortunately, I've got a recording, I think. There's a, or there's a YouTube video about like her on a record. Right. Yes, it came but, with a how to play book. Yeah, I mean that's about the only thing that I've I've found. So I was curious if you've seen that. Um, I wanted before I jump to a couple more questions about the ukulele revival. When you're going through and naming things, it looks like Liz is always the one that comes up with the names of all these things. Is that always true? Is she just naturally good with coming up with those names? Yes, <laughs> in a word, she's great at it, and. Uh, and it brought us both tremendous pleasure to to you know to think about these things because we just had sort of similar heads about this stuff. We loved marketing, and um, and she was just great at it. So yes, yeah, she came up with Jumpin' Jim, for example, um, and she came up with Flea Market Music, and she uh, named uh, my sister and brother-in-law's company the Magic Fluke. She named the Fluke. She named the Flea. Uh, she came up with the line you. Can change the world. Yep. Uh, so, um, so yes, she's particularly good at it, and uh, and that's just uh, that's just one of her many gifts. And then when I read in there that she'd also come up with the TriStar logo that was hers, and that she had done the opening credits of Home Alone, right. you know, which you know my boys have watched with me. And in fact, I just did a play along from somewhere in my memory. 
mm -hmm. um, this last week. So, I mean, it just those are the things that just knock you off your seat thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I've, I've said hello to that person, not that they would remember you or whatever, but just, you know, it's again, it's seven degrees of separation, right? Um, big question. In 1993 was the first time, according to your book, that you were asked about an ukulele revival. By 1996, you kept getting inter interviewed about it. By 1998, it was pretty certain. And this is even before I would even say it was true. I, I put it at the combination of your resources, Jake Shimabakuru's uh, performance in Central Park that I guess was just recorded by somebody else and posted. Right. And then um, is is Over the Rainbow. And those kind of all align like in the early 2000s. But by 1998, you'd already seen that that revival was there. It's 2021, almost 2022. And by the way, this is going to drop on your birthday. So a very early happy birthday to you. And Liz's is just in a couple of days. If you guys don't know, Jim's birthday is December 25th. And uh, Liz's birthday is on the 23rd, right. according to the book. Um, but 2021 going to 2022, do you think this third wave is just going to be there? Or do you think it has the potential to, to still fade? I don't know. My, you know, my, I, I honestly, both of us for years have thought that it was going to fade years ago, right? Because, you know, how many things kind of, you know, most things kind of, you know, especially fads, you know, kind of come and go. And so honestly, we were anticipating that the, you know, that, that this would also have kind of, you know, its major bloom and then, you know, and then, and, and then kind of slowly decline and it just hasn't happened. And of course we're ever thankful for that. Sure. And, um, and, you know, maybe maybe it is sort of the exception that proves the rule. I don't know. But it does bring an enormous amount of pleasure to a lot of people. And now it seems like more than ever, it crosses multiple generations, right? So I write a lot about, because it was my experience, I write a lot about people who were either my age or older in the book. And then I, you know, and then of course the Daily Ukulele was created with a particular demographic in mind, you know, I was thinking of of the ukulele clubs that that I had seen um, prior to creating that book, and 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 for the most part, these were people that we had seen throughout our our U journey. They were generally our age or older, semi-retired or retired, and they were getting enormous pleasure out of being with others. And that's why they they flooded uke fests. I mean, it just every uke fest for, you know, for a long time. And some of these uke fests would get, you know, a thousand people. It was just, it was the most fun thing for a lot of people. But it was mostly a, a demographic that we got to know pretty well. And what I think has changed is that somehow or another, there were enough young people who began to play it that um, that you know it, it started to move from sort of this older demographic to a younger and you know the one experience I guess that I had that 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 at least is generational was working with Eddie Vedder mm -hmm. um, and and that was very special because you know I learned that Eddie Eddie Vedder who is for those who don't know he's the he he is the vocal of the you know the lead vocalist and kind of the most visible guy behind the band Pearl Jam. And um, and he's a great guitarist, great songwriter, but I guess he was in Hawaii and on a whim, he finds a uke. And then I guess he finds our songbooks many years ago and he teaches himself to play from our songbooks. And so years later, when he decides he's having so much fun on this instrument and he's actually written a bunch of, you know, original songs on the uke, he, he his people reached out to me and said, you know, he'd really like to have a book that goes along with his ukulele songs record that is like a jump in Jim's book. And so we did it and it was a, it was a great experience. And, you know, of course he was a generation younger than I was. And you can find that record. That's the ukulele songs, right? That's, that's his album. That you, yeah. That you can find anywhere. You can find it on Spotify. And unfortunately it's much harder to find the song book. They, they, uh, yes. Yeah, that almost instantly sold out the minute that it became available, and it, it it went 
like so many things, it went through the, the Pearl Jam fan club. And so before it even was available, it was completely sold out. But you can find them you know, occasionally on eBay. All right, so that's going to end part one of this interview with Jim Biloff, who was extremely gracious with his time and visited for quite a while longer about issues about the ukulele and his experiences. And I hope that you'll come back for part two of this podcast. Part one is releasing on Christmas Day, which is Jim's birthday. And part two, I'll set to release on New Year's Day. All right, thanks so much for listening to the podcast or watching the podcast. And keep your eyes out for part two of this interview with Jim Biloff about his new book, Utopia.